Welcome back to Nick Lenz's Doctor Who Reviews, episode 25. Wow, it's been a long time since I've actually done a 25th episode for a review series. A long time. Like, unless it's an anime review, it seems as though basically that the last time I can think of that's a non-anime review that hit 25, I can think of, was probably my Super Sentai reviews. That was probably my last official one that did that. But that was about five years ago. Okay. Now this one is for Doctor Who Review. We're talking about a story from the fifth Doctor's era. Peter Davidson. My favorite Doctor from the classic era. I love the guy's stories. <clears throat> He's one of the two I really love almost every single story these two guys are involved with. The other course being Patrick Chung. Given the fact I viewed a lot of the guy's era. So of course basically... I expect how much I love Patrick Chung's stories. And given the fact that how much I love Peter Davidson's stories, you're probably thinking, why in the world are you, you why is this only your, technically your third ever one you ever talked about? Because, um, it doesn't kind of immediately to mind basically which one I want to get next per se. I do have one coming out of the way, a Tom Baker story. Yes. But before that, um, before I get a chance to review that, I'm going to review the previous story, which is the final story for John Pertry's run, which I'll get to that in a later video. This one is from, uh, this story in particular is a noteworthy story, and it's the most infamous one out of Peter Davis's entire run. Yes, released in 1982 during his first year on the show. Yes. Okay, here we go. Yes, coming from the 1960s season of Doctor Who. But this is technically from the very first season of Pierre Davison's run. And this is overall his fourth story. Yeah, and this is his most infamous one. The last story, before this one, it's a mentis one. Was basically called Conda. And this one basically involves a supernatural snake that appeared in like two stories and it was referenced in an episode of the New Who for Time Crash. Yes. Yeah, that's what the Mara is. It's basically a supernatural snake. And this is the very next story. This one is done by Edward Stewart. He's pretty much the writer of this episode. Mm-hmm. Yes. With Peter Moffat as the director. Yes, this guy also directed a few other Doctor Who stories. He basically directed several of them. The first one he did was Dave Decay, which was a Tom Baker story. Yep. Which, this was not the story that introduced Adric. Nope, that was the previous one. He also directed the first of the Black Guardian trilogy, the 20th, the, the 20th anniversary special, Twin Dilemma, which was the story that debuted, was the first story for Colin Baker and Two Doctors. I love that one. This one's called The Vegetation, which came out in February of 1982. Yes, why is this one so infamous, basically, among all of Peter Davison stories? Because the story is not worth to be the final appearance in Classic Who of the Sonic Screwdriver that made its first appearance way back in Period of Deep. Yes, and this was not a decision made by Peter David or the writer. It was made by the showrunner at the time, John Nathan Turner. Basically, had a thing destroyed, and like the original plan was to have a drawer filled with a bunch of Sonic screwdrivers, and John Nathan Turner's like, nope, we're basically getting rid of the Sonic screwdriver. In story, they basically have it where the Doctor, Nissa, and Tegan, uh, uh, Adric also. We're basically trying to get back to the airport where Negan go is wor works at. Basically, they've been trying to do this since since the episode Legopolis, and they do arrive at Heathrow, but three hundred years early. They say it's the seventeenth century, so my guess is the sixteen eighties. Yep. And by the way, this is a four-parter. 
Yes, the thing with Peter Davis's run, with the exception of like one story, one or two stories, generally put all the stories were four parters. Uh, the only ones that weren't, uh, one was uh, Black Orchid. That was a quick two parter, which is the story that came after this one, by the way. And there was also The King's Demons. That was a two parter as well. Yep. But those two were the only known two parters this entire run. And you thinking, was there any others? Uh, no. No, seriously, there was like no other one. Yeah, everything else was mostly, with the exception of Black Orchid and King's Demons. And of course, there's also The Awakening. That was also a, um, that was also a two-parter. But mostly, I would say everything else for this era was to put all four parters. Yep, all four parters. And I would love to discuss more of the stories. Oh, by the way, Visitation comes basically two stories before Earthshock, which was the sixth story of season 19 of the show. Yep, so, yeah, it's interesting, though, when it comes to Peter Davison stories, where all the stories I review for him are all from season 19, his first year of the show. So, they before we see the Doctor, we see this we see this noble family living in this castle. Well, not castle, more like a manor, where everything's like a normal night, and they think it's cold, it's going to be a warm evening, because the, guy, because the father's losing a chest and all things. And there's a shining star, which that's actually something that leads, that's actually something that's part of the story. Which involves this creature here, and this android. The android, I gotta say, looks actually pretty good for 1980 standards. Though it's mostly a guy in the suit, but, yeah, it looks pretty good for, for this era. At least it's not like the way it was with the, with the character the Chameleon, who appeared in two stories. And the reason why uh, is quite dumb, because apparently the guy who created him passed away, and they had no idea what to do with the damn character. So they killed him off in the very next story, they, they appear in. Yep. So, they show up, and apparently, like, oh, like, uh, there's somebody in the basement, they managed to kill one of these creatures, and then, of course, the daughter notices something banging at the door in this uh, study... For 17th century, for this study, it's not exactly very noteworthy. Breaks the door, and here's the android. They shoot it, and then we cut away to outside next day. And you're probably wondering, what the heck happened here? Off screen, all three are murdered by the alien of the episode. Yep, that's what happened. They got murdered. And you're probably thinking, why the heck were they killed? The honest answer is, I have no idea. Well, they wanted the house as a base operations. So eventually, of course, the doctor who arrives at the manor, and then as soon as he gets outside, he is attacked by people who think he's got the plague. And you're probably thinking, what plague, you might ask. Now, given how the stupid stuff happens nowadays, like, like, what plague is it talking about? Ugh, like it doesn't really say exactly which one basically it was it's not really going to detail just like some plague <laughs> yeah so Apparently this plague was started by the aliens for reasons. And they want to take over the world with four people. Seriously. Yeah. So, they they encounter a highwayman. Who also would describe himself as a thespian. Yes, a actor by the name of Richard Mess. Richard Mace. So... Basically, they bring him to a barn, and of course they have discovered, oh, there's power packs. What's the purpose of these damn things? It involves alien weapons. Yes, alien weapons in 17th century England. Okay. 
Now, why did it specifically land this particular point in time? Don't know. A lot of the time, Doctor Who, when they have aliens pop up in the past, usually there's not really a specific reason why. It's just that that's when they arrive. And the Doctor basically has to try to stop them for whatever reason that involves them. Probably one of the most weirdest ones I've seen was one that involved King James, played by Alan Cumming. Where it involves some ooze stuff trapped inside of a tree. Yeah, this is basically a Jodie Whittaker story. And they wanted to use King James, who by the way is a real life person. This is actually the guy who succeeded Queen Elizabeth. Not the current Queen Elizabeth, the original one. And... Of course, they talk about some real life things. I will get to, I'll, I'll get a chance to talk about that one. How really good, how how well written that, that episode is. I'll talk about it later. So, oh, and by the way, the alien has brainwashed an entire village. Now, when the heck did he do this? Apparently, off screen. And how does he control the villagers via a a device on their wrist that look like simply wrist watches? Now. From the perspective of someone from that century, you probably think, man, that looks quite weird. Also, Richard found himself a particular device, which turned out to be a bracelet. And it turns out the aliens who arrived are escaped prisoners. Yep, escape prisoners. And, of course, the doctor identifies the species as a... Terpless. Yes, that's what he calls them. And he mentions, oh, there's a scar on the guy's face. Yeah, you don't get that particular prison. That's basically what Doctor describes it. And throughout this whole entire four part, which by the way feels very quick a lot of the time. Yep. So they 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 go to the to to the more the the miller, and I'm thinking, what the heck is the miller? My it's some carriage driver who looks like they it looked like a transport thing. And the guy apparently doesn't listen whenever you talk to him. He just he just does his own thing. Heck, when they, when they when they have the doctor and the companions arrive at the manor, he nearly runs them over and does anything about it at all. And I'm thinking, wouldn't the Miller basically be under like it's suspected he's under my control? But eventually, of course, the the thing that people freed later. So. The doctor gets down to the base, gets inside this house, and there's a. I, I gotta admit, this actually is a nice looking house for 17th century standards. And they get to the base, oh, this particular wall, and then, and of course, you have Nissa in there where they break in and look about, and of course, about the, the power packs and the gunpowder. They break inside the doctor's game with a particular wall. And the first episode ends with, oh, the doctor has disappeared. Where the heck did he go? For the next episode, oh, yeah, he was on the other side of the wall. Which turns out to be an illusion. Which, yeah, as as Mace basically pointed out, though, yeah, he's very familiar with illusions. Like, oh, they, you, you make a bundle at, at uh, carnivals with this stuff. And apparently there's some kind of particular gas in the basement, which apparently for the alien species, who are very curious about them. As for the android, well, when he's in, when he's in a particular cloak, basically, he's wearing... It's described he's like living death itself. He's like the Grim Reaper. And then, of course, he shoots Nessa and Adric. Yep. Though eventually, Adric himself escapes and then brings the TARDIS, which, of course, Nessa went back to TARDIS. Uh, Mace and the Doctor went to, the, went to go visit the Miller. And he developed a device to basically take out the aliens. And here's the thing. Adric actually successfully trans uh, moves the TARDIS. Yes, he moves the TARDIS. A thing that that is part of a recurring trope of Doctor Who for a classic era is that he's terrible at driving a damn thing. Yes, he's terrible at steering it. And Adric has no problem. And from what I've heard, yeah, people at the time when Adric was on the show, from what I've heard from one particular person... His reception was very overwhelmingly negative. When they finally killed the character off in Earthshock, and that's when Matthew Waterhouse decided to leave the show, he never came back. Not even for Big I think he did come back for Big Finish stuff, but he stayed away from the show. He never came back. Nope. He never did. 
And you're thinking, really? Oh yeah, he did. He stayed far away. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in the case of Adric himself, Matthew Warhouse does not even play the character at all. Nope. Like, he pretty much is in, like, well, like a few stories. Like, the first story he's in, he's not even played by him at all. Nope. He isn't. Now, as for why, well, people want to leave the show, and he abide by the wishes. Matthew Warhouse stayed far away from Doctor Who for over 30 years. He has stayed far away from it. I guess some people are pretty happy with him doing that. Yep. So, eventually, of course, they, the Doctor unlocks the device, basically, thanks to his sonic screwdriver, and then when the alien comes across it later on, he destroys it. Yep, and that's last you see at the Sky Screwdriver. Yes, according to what I've heard, the reason why they got rid of the Sky Screwdriver in this episode, according to John Nathan Turner, it become too inconvenient, and things make it too easy for the Doctor to get out of the situations he's in. So he remains hand and a joke it may, it may time crash. Oh, he's hands free throughout the rest of his tenure. Yep. So, and I'm thinking like, wait. Are you saying for the next eight years he never had a sonic screwdriver? Yep, until 1989? Yeah, he never had it. The sonic screwdriver does not return after this until the Doctor Who movie released in the mid-1990s. Yes, it takes that long for that sonic screwdriver to come back. In a movie that has not been well received. It's canon per se. Yes, it's canon. Now, people have some problems with the movie... Like the master, the doctor's lying, he's half human's mother's side. Yes. So eventually, of course, at the end of the story, the doctor inadvertently starts a great fire of London. When, of course, he kills off the, when he has gets rid of the aliens in the story, Richard Mason himself, of course, goes back to what he was doing. And they also managed, apparently, when this plague broke out, apparently the theater shut down. You watch it, they're like, man, this sounds like pretty much like reality. Like about two years ago, where everything was shutting down because of a, because of some kind of virus or whatever. Yes, it sounds so similar. Like watching this now is like so similar to the way stuff was happening two years ago. But this thing came out in 1982, not 2020. <laughs> yeah, to say at least that. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's still a good classic story. It's just that. It just follows some, some Doctor Who tropes I'm not really a big fan of. And this story in particular, well, I mainly wanted to get I mainly wanted it because I want to talk about the whole thing with Sonic Screwdriver stuff. But aside from the fact this is the end of the Sonic Screwdriver, it's not really that big of an outworthy story, so I have back out a nod to to actual real life history. When the fire that they started is at Pudding Lane, which is uh, allegedly where the fire started for Great Fire in London. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna give the story roughly a. Uh, I'm gonna give it eight out of ten. It's a bit lower of a standard. I mean, I do enjoy Peter Davison's stories. I mean, I think Peter Davis himself does an absolute really good job with the story. Yes, he does. Uh, I think he is on pretty tough form. At one point, Nessa, not Tegan, is brainwashed, though she's eventually freed. And a lot of people are thinking, "Man, I wish Adric was brainwashed and get rid of him." <laughs> So for that, yes. But not much I'll say about this one. It's just that, well, it's only the Peter Davison's fourth story. There's a lot better stories in this one. And I'll discuss those when I get a chance to get my hands on more Peter Davison stories. Though the very next one I'm hoping to talk about is a John Pertree story. Which one it is, you'll find out when I talk about it. Okay? So yeah, that's a single view. Uh, next one is going to be my hero academia okay next video